morning. I'm Christine Thar, and I am um, pleased to introduce our, our guest speaker this morning. Um, it's someone that I've just recently met. Also, I've taken over the Car Keys uh, program, if you are familiar with that. That's, um, and it's such a long acronym. Car Restraints Keep Every Youngster Safe is what it stands for. And so um, we have received a generous uh, grant from Coles Cares. And so we go around and partner with the, um, the, the name of it is the Louisiana, Louisiana Passenger, Passenger Safety, Safety Task, Task, Task Force and the uh, Louisiana State Police. And we do car seat checks. Um, and so it's it's been very uh, interesting. Um, I don't have kids in car seats anymore, but I, I remember when I did, I took them to one of these seat checks, and my seat was our our seat was not as secure as it should have been. And so it's very um, interesting to see how many people that come through these car seat checks, their car seats expired or they're not in correctly. I think it's like eighty percent or so. Anyway, um, so I'm pleased to introduce Bill Gaines. He's with the, he's a retired sheriff department, <laughs> retired from the sheriff's department, and with the, what I just said. <laughs> and so we're pleased to have you this morning. Thank you for coming. Thank y'all for uh, inviting me. As you said, I'm Bill Gaines. Uh, I'm the uh, Region G Coordinator uh, for the Louisiana Passenger Safety Task Force, uh, which is a coalition basically of uh, folks that volunteer to help uh, increase the awareness and also the actual uh, safety of children in motor vehicles uh, and also adults. Uh, that's why it's the passenger safety. Uh, I'm a certified uh, child passenger safety technician instructor. Uh, so I teach people um, how to be passenger safety technicians. Uh, that's a 32 hour course uh, that teaches people the different types of seats. I did not bring uh, a lot of seats in here because this is not really a hands on uh, lecture. Uh, but we'll go through the slide and you'll see the different types of seats. If y'all are being pediatricians, uh, whether you're in practice now or you know, set up a practice, uh, y'all are a real good target audience for the message of, um, of passenger safety. This was a required thing. Um, the, uh, the only uh, compensation I get um, is if I teach a class, I do that on a contract and that's done through the uh, hospital in New Orleans uh, and then I get a stipend we only did that this last year this year's uh, grant year has not started I may or may not get a stipend uh, for doing these type things as part of my duties as the uh, passenger safety uh, coordinator for the uh, region G area which is the troop G area the seven parishes of, of what's the same as the Louisiana State Police uh, these are our objectives uh, we do want to expand the target audience's awareness of the connection between the proper occupant protection, device usage, and the reduction and prevention of uh, motor vehicle related deaths and injuries. And then we want to influence proper usage of existing passenger safety devices by the populace as a whole through y'all. Uh, and that'll help reduce the uh, number of injuries and deaths in motor vehicle crashes. Um, and one of the, we'll discuss later the means of that. This is the, taken directly from the uh, Louisiana Highway Safety um, Task uh, website. Uh, it'll, there's a, a link that'll be uh, in your handout. Uh, there's a lot of good other links in there. Uh, this actually needs some updating. Uh, 
this is, like I say, it's a four-day course now. Uh, but this is this is basically the mission statement of the uh, Louisiana Passenger Safety Task Force. I'm going to do it right into the meat. You look here, uh, these totals, you're more likely to be killed in a motor vehicle crash than in a, in a homicide. The uh, total, this is national, and this is the death per 100,000. Still, it's 2.2 and a half times. It's been that way for a long time. Uh, we actually want both of them to go down to zero. Um, but if you look at the uh, some statistics, uh, children, 19% of the population, 3% of traffic deaths. Uh, that's nationwide. We have 33 in Louisiana. Then you look at injuries. That's how many children were injured nationwide. And that's the Louisiana numbers. Um, Louisiana has a higher uh, homicide rate than nationwide, but we still are one, almost one and a half times more people <coughs> are killed in motor vehicle crashes. Look at the, this is what we're trying to stop right here. If, if we're effective in getting everyone to be properly restrained in their vehicle, which you're, you're in a, in a pre-crash position, then one day it's going to be zero people are unrestrained, but because we drive at high speeds, there's still going to be deaths. Um, but we want to have that, and it sounds bad, but you want to have 100% of your deaths are people that are buckled up. That's, I mean, that's the way it is, and that's what's going to bring the number of fatalities down. If you look here, 80%, the, the highway safety, oh, or it's the wrong button, 80% uh, of the children that were killed in motor vehicle crashes in Louisiana were either unrestrained or they were improperly restrained. The, if I had to put that up because the Highway Safety Commission at that time had captured a little more information than what they capture nationally. These are the these are from the high, <coughs> Center for Disease Control. If you look. These are the top 10 deaths. 2014 is the last year uh, that's up to date. This was just published in May. See unintentional injuries. We we'll want to break that down further in the next slide. If you look, if you look at the age group of the people that you normally be treating, you would cut off somewhere in the middle here. Uh, see how traffic deaths are in the top for the most part. And for the past 10 years, it's pretty much been consistent. It even went this far at one time. Uh, and drownings and traffic have swapped places back and forth over the last 10 years. Uh, so it's a real bad problem. And it's a problem. <laughs> keep hitting the wrong button. It's a problem all the way through, if you look. Uh, if you think about top 10 causes of death, well, it's Top, top two for everyone except for infants, and that's because the message has gotten out so great. And uh, infants don't travel as much as older people because the people stay home a lot with their infants. They're not driving around as much. Well, this shows the magnitude of the problem, and that's the reason we're trying to get folks to make sure everyone's buckled up properly. These are things that are related to injury prevention uh, and motor vehicle crashes. None of these are in any particular order, uh, and this is not everything that's related. Um, if you know, all of these things have a have a great deal. This ha this has a lot to do with uh, a lot of things, and the education is something that we give 
about buckling up. In the, in the unfortunate event that you uh, are in a crash, you want to be in the best position that you can be in to reduce your injury, and that's by being buckled up, or if you have a child, to have them in a proper child restraint. Child safety seats, another acronym. These are the three stages of a, a collision. You have the vehicle that collides with an object or another vehicle. Then you have the human crash is where people hit something in the vehicle. What we want is for everybody to hit the seat belt and the airbag. We want them to hit it in the proper position. And then you have the internal crash. Depending on the uh, speed, your organs are still moving inside your body. Um, you know, they say it's not the, the, the movement that kills you, it's the stopping. Well, on the internal crash, if at certain speed, um, your brain will move inside your skull, your heart will move, and all of those vessels can only stretch so far. When it comes to uh, children, because their bones are not fully fused together, their spinal cord is much more susceptible to injury than adults and, and older children. You don't have to have don't have to have the first one to have these other two. In a sudden stop, you can uh, achieve almost one G and sometimes above in heavy braking. So that's like a 20 mile an hour crash. That one G can happen very fast. So you want to stay buckled up because can't hold somebody back or you can't hold yourself back in that 1G. So you're still going to perhaps hit something in the vehicle or your internal organs will be moving at, at a high. So we want everyone to stay buckled up all the time because even if you're not in a physical crash, even heavy braking can cause the, the second and third functions. This is a video. Let's see if I can get it to play here. Talk about the three stages of a collision. When one vehicle collides with another vehicle or object, the damages go far beyond bent metal and broken headlights. There are actually three stages of a typical collision. Each stage is unique and occurs quickly. The higher the speed, the more severe the outcome. The vehicle itself is the first to take the impact of a collision. Coming to an abrupt stop, the vehicle buckles and bends. This all happens in about one-tenth of a second. Following the vehicle crash is the human crash. The occupants hit some part of the vehicle, hopefully the safety belt and airbags. If the occupants are not wearing safety belts, they will continue traveling at the same speed as the vehicle was traveling, slamming into the dashboard, windshield, or some other part of the vehicle's interior. They may even collide with other passengers. When the occupant's body has come to an apparent stop, the internal organs are still moving, hitting other organs or bones in the body. This internal crash, though silent and not visible to the naked eye, can cause fatal injuries. Statistically, it's highly likely that you will be involved in several collisions during your lifetime. If you're lucky, the only damage sustained will be to your vehicle. Remember, a preventable collision is a collision in which the driver fails to do everything reasonable to avoid it. How many people have been in a crash? More than one? How many have been in a crash where an airbag deployed? Several. Like it's pretty surprising when that thing goes off and you don't even realize that it is. Um, we'll discuss that a little bit uh, further. It's, we're just going to explain this is something that you can pass on about explaining uh, the crash forces and what it takes to hold somebody back in a car. Uh, if you look, the vehicle going 40, same as falling off of a 50-foot cliff. The person's still moving that speed as well. 
Um, people see them in parking lots, not wearing their uh, seat belts. And the children, they drive in the parking lot, you see them standing up in the car. Um, parking lot speed. If you do you want your baby's head to fall from that far uh, and hit something hard in the car? That's why everybody needs to be buckled up all the time uh, because you can die in a fall from your own height. Um, it, it's happened to a lot of people. Uh, uh, I always use uh, Natasha Richardson as an example. She's standing on skis and falls over, hits her head on rocks, and she subsequently dies from that. So it doesn't take a, a lot of energy to jar your brain enough to kill you. These are different types of crashes. On side crashes, if you're not sliding sideways, somebody else has had a frontal crash. So all these things can happen. Uh, this one here, if you're properly restrained, is very unlikely to happen unless you have a catastrophic event that causes the seat belt to be broken and the car to break in half, which I've worked those types of wrecks. And a lot of times nobody survives those. This is how car seats, booster seats, and seat belts prevent injury. The number one thing, they keep you in the vehicle. It, it, you're protected from the outside world inside of that, that vehicle. So if you're not getting outside, you're not going to meet the road, you're not going to meet a tree, uh, you're not going to meet another car uh, outside of that cocoon. You're going to be protected to the point that your vehicle is designed to protect you. Seat belts and car restraints, the harnesses within them connect the strongest parts of the body. They connect at the hips and across the chest. Um, the fit is very important. If you ride it in your car, you want to make sure that that seat belt's down low on your hips, not up on your belly because all you have is soft tissue here and the seat belt will just like a knife cut through the soft tissue until it hits something hard which is usually your backbone and your backbone being flexible it knocks one of those out of joint so this is one of those things we do because it's made out of a semi uh, flexible material that stretches it lets lets that time of the crash spread out and just a tiny bit of time makes a lot of difference when it comes to transfer of energy. And then of course we want to protect the head, brain, and the spinal cord. Uh, those are things that we have not, what's inside of the head, the brain, we haven't learned how to fix those. Uh, there's a lot of strides being made, but we have not really learned how to fix the brain injury. And we haven't learned how to fix the spinal cord injury. Those are permanent, lifelong injuries and that's what we're trying to reduce. And hopefully one day we'll be able to eliminate them. Your chances of survival increase dramatically when you're appropriately restrained. It's about 70% in rear-facing car seats for most crashes. Uh, that's, that's a big difference. That's almost double your chance of living. And it's about 50, around 50% uh, for people in forward facing and also in, in uh, regular seat belts. If you'll notice, uh, both of these children are rear facing. Uh, so when the, when the crash occurs, they're going to be cushioned a lot more. The, the optimum way to ride would uh, actually everybody ride rear facing but there's no way to design an automobile that everyone can ride rear facing. And even if you could turn the front seat passenger around, then you would have the problem of blocking the driver's view. So front seat passengers are pretty much confined to riding to the front, and that's why we ask everyone not to ride in the front, especially children. I'm going to talk a little bit about airbags, and this is one of those things about children. 
and, and riding in the front seat. Airbags are specific to different vehicles. I'm, I'm only going to talk about these automatic airbags because most of the fleet now has automatic airbags. Um, you should assume the airbag is on, even if it's not, because it can go off in a collision. And it doesn't have to be real severe. The children, by their shorter stature, are out of position for most airbags. The airbag is designed actually to protect the upper torso and the, and the head in adults. So if you have a child, it actually they could actually go under the airbag or they could be in a bad position where the airbag does not fully put deploy. Uh, rear facing seats are always out of position in the front because they're facing the rear. You're going to have the child's head about three or four inches from the airbag. The, um, that's why I never put a child, even if you have an automatic airbag, and I'll explain that in just a second. You need to understand, and this is going to be vehicle specific. They're going to have a light that says the airbag's off, and they'll have, a, you know, with the lights not on, the airbag on. But if you ever put things in your car, uh, or you have somebody ride with you that moves around in the seat a lot, you may see that light go on and off. The, the computer that works the airbag is a tiny little brain. About, a, about like a fly's brain, if you think about it, and it's getting limited information. So whatever its little brain tells it at the time of the collision is when it decides whether it deploys the airbag. That's the only decision it has to make. Do I deploy the airbag or do I not? So if the seat is not in properly and you've got heavy braking or whatever, People are leaning forward, and it's going to say deploy the airbag. And that's going to be that child's face, or even the adult's face, and, or that infant seat that's right there by the airbag. If you're driving, they say a safe distance to be from the steering wheel is 10 to 12 inches. You need that airbag to fully deploy before you meet it. Otherwise, it's pushing you back, and you get injured by the airbag. This is a, um, when you'll get a chance, you go look out in your car, every car uh, nowadays, if you have one made in the 80s that doesn't have an airbag, it's going to have this warning over the visor. It'll also be in your owner's manual. But over the visor on the passenger side, it'll have this warning. And that's, if you look, never put a rear-facing child in the front seat because they know they can't control when that airbag is going to go off. They, been given up to that tiny little computer. This is a, a side airbag warning. If you have side airbags, they may be on the door pillar or they may be inside the door or they may only be in your owner's manual. Um, this is again out of position. If you have a, a small child riding in a car uh, in a regular seat belt or in a booster seat and they're and it deploys from the side of the seat. If they're asleep up against that, it's a possibility they'll be injured by the deploying air seat. So the main thing is to stay in position. That's why we want to keep children in car seats as long as we can, and also uh, keep them in the proper position. Car seat keeps them in the proper position. So if you were going to ask about airbags, you would ask where they are, how, how they work, and does it go on or off automatically, and how the airbags affect the car seat or the booster seat. <coughs> These are seat belt questions. If you were going to have somebody that called you up and say, I want to get a child seat for my child, you need to know all this information. There's not a one size fits all. There's not a magic number. Um, special needs, all special needs children don't need a special seat. Um, 
and that's something to work with uh, if you have some physical therapists, uh, child passenger safety people. Uh, we don't necessarily have the seats, but we can check and see if that child, if it's just a behavior problem, or we can check and see if they have that. So in some of your handout material, it has the fitting stations, um, so we can look at that. And then the type of child seat, we'll look at that here directly. These are basically your four different types of child seats. And this, look at this line, goes from birth and they're going 12 plus. Um, the rear facing, as I said earlier, this age two, that is what we're trying to get people to go at least to age two in rear facing seats. Uh, if you want to go beyond that, you can't go wrong, as I said earlier. Rear facing is more protection. And then as they get too heavy for this, then you move them into a forward facing seat. And you look, none of these lines are bright lines. Everything overlaps. So there is no bright line, there's no magic number. Everyone, that's one of the calls I always get, when can I turn my seat around? When can they move into a booster seat? When can they move into the car seat? And all those things are, it depends. There's no, there's no individual answer. But if you look at these, and also in one of your handouts, it, uh, it has the uh, list that's almost identical to this, but it has a little bit more information. This is why rear facing is important. Usually in a cop class, everybody laughs because it shows a big head baby. Uh, but that's the way it is. That's, that's why that's, uh, you know, that our, because of our big brains, that part of our, our body actually develops first and then the rest catches up. This is why we ride rear facing. If you think about this big head being held by this tiny neck, it, it, you just can't do it. Uh, even though babies, I've got 10 grandchildren. Uh, and some of them are born almost walking and talking now. Every last one of them, and they they don't look like me. They're they're all they're all well uh, muscled, and they don't have excess baggage. But all of them weighed almost nine pounds when they were born. They're just they're huge when they're born, and uh, and they're not fat. They're just big babies. So, but they still can't hold that head in a crash. We, you know, as we explained earlier, um, if their head is a third of their weight or a quarter of their weight, they're not going to be able to do it. I mean, if you think you uh, could hold your, your, your head in your hands, and then when you're going 20 miles an hour, it stops, your fingers aren't going to hold that 10 pounds. And a baby, you know, that little neck's not going to hold it. So that's why we ride rear facing. The, you know, the bones and muscles aren't developed. And then as we get older, it becomes less dangerous. It's not more safe. It's less dangerous to move them forward facing and let them ride more like a dog. Okay, this is a video. Um, there's no sound on this and it will say there's no sound. But it shows the difference in forces of a rear facing seat and a forward facing seat. Yes.
those were the same size dolls in, in both of those seats. That was the exact same seat, it was just one was done rear facing and one was done forward facing. Anyway, you see that uh, let me get the next slide. See how that showed how much the forces are different in the way that you're held in the crash. Uh, Y'all have all heard about shaken baby syndrome. Well, that's it. Twenty times what however fast you're going. That's that that spine can't take it. The brain inside. Uh, that's why we have we want to do rear facing. Uh, today's rear facing car seats. This this is a big thing. They offer more weight. Just like I said, those babies I had a grandbaby, eight nine pounds. Uh, the old car seats went to twenty pounds. Now they've got them that go to forty almost 50 pounds rear facing. So you can put a large child and let them still ride rear facing. If you go back to that, think back to that video when it showed the child in the rear facing seat getting, uh, people worry about their feet touching the back of the seat and some, the, their legs or whatever. You saw that the leg went up, the legs hardly ever get injured in, in those things and, and what what doesn't heal and what does heal. And the forward facing seat, uh, children suffer a lot more leg injuries because they're pushed that much closer to the seat in front of them. So the longer they can ride rear facing, the more protection they're gonna have. Seats are larger, as I said, uh, they're also longer. One of the issues is putting the uh, seat in the car because some of the seats are so long it's really hard to get a good fit uh, rear facing and that's something that you just have to work out you may need to transition seats um, instead of buying this huge seat when you have a small baby buy one that's a little bit smaller and then as they get bigger buy the larger seat because you don't have to have the, quite the recline once the child gets to where it can hold its head up um, and you can put the seat more upright and make sure everyone else is comfortable. More harness slots, um, so that lets, it, lets you use it in, uh, for a longer period of time. And then the comfort measures like side impact protection and extra padding and things like that. And that's just to keep people keeping their children rear facing longer. Um, it, if we can get that word out, the, the rear face is the safest. People say, I want to see my child. Well, if you're driving the car and you're looking at your child, what are you not doing? You're not watching the road. So there, your, your chances of being in a crash are, are much more uh, increased. These are our links. They should be on your handout. If you, if you everybody have a pen, I know one thing I forgot to do at the beginning, and that was to have y'all uh, do the buckle up test on your handout. Should have done that at the beginning. But take about three or four minutes and do your buckle up test. And then I'll have you add a link to your uh, I don't know. I have I have one pen. If anybody needs one, might have two. Who thinks they have the answer to number one?
seatbelt on. What was about six? It's D. It's within <laughs> 25 miles. <coughs> Number seven. Job restraint use drops when parents don't wear their seatbelts. In 2012, uh, approximately how many lives do you think were saved? They, they say C. There's no way to tell really how many lives are saved by people wearing their seatbelts. Because crashes where somebody is not injured, uh, what, what would have happened to them if they weren't wearing their seatbelt? So that's just an estimate of people that weren't injured. Uh, and number nine? B. That's two-thirds. That's, that's, that's way too many people not to be wearing their seatbelt. Um, and that just shows uh, that the message that's why we want to start the message from birth, you know. That way that child, by the time they get that age, they're already got that behavior ingrained into them. And number 10. That was pretty much a given, wasn't it? Okay, on your links page, if, if y'all have a pen, let me get you to add this link, because I know all of you are not going to practice in Louisiana, probably. Some of you are from other places. Uh, how, how many people are from out of state? Y'all plan to go back home or go somewhere even better? <laughs> uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's how a lot of people do. I mean, even people that live here that are taking this course uh, may want to go somewhere else. So add this link to your uh, list of links, www.ghsa.com. That's Governor's Highway Safety Administration. 
dot org. It might be association. Yeah, no, it's administration. That has links that bring up the laws for every state. And what we teach is the best practice, which exceeds any law. The law is always behind the best practice because you have people that want to bargain, and you can't bargain with physics. Um, they're always going to be there. So when you when you turn your child around, uh, those are under the law. You can turn the child around at one. People call me up and say, "One, can I turn him around?" And I was say, "That's your decision, but." Do you really want to? What is your reason? That would be like if you gave a prescription to someone for a painkiller and they call you up and go, how many of these can I take before it kills me? You say, you don't do that. You take what I tell you to take because that's what's going to do the best for you. And that's the way we are. We don't want children or anyone to be moved into a less safe position. Uh, and that's why we're preaching that deal about keeping them. Now, the, the things about expanding the base and the tr non-traditional means are y'all as doctors can spread this word to your patients. Your patients are going to be captive when they come to visit you. They're here for help, but they're there. They're in your office. So you could spread the message by a simple question like, how did you get here today? And they say, we came in a car. Well, were you buckled up? Is the baby in a proper car seat? And you don't have to know every answer to those questions, but if it's no, you have all kinds of information that you can give them about the proper use, you know. Your baby's more likely to be killed in a car crash than, than it is to uh, die from the flu. Um, so those are the, the messages. You can make handouts. Uh, Christine's got handouts. If you look at that one small one, that's a fitting station. You can recommend without knowing the actual way to put a seat in, you can recommend that person go and get a seat checkup. Uh, our task force does checkups all over the state several times a year. And if you go to another state, if you go to that Safe Kids website, or if you go to the NHTSA website, the safercar.gov, you can look up where there are technicians in your in your area. So that's what we're here, trying to get the message out Asking y'all's help, take that extra step, just like you give out uh, information on inoculation, just when you need to bring the baby back. You could give them something as simple as that, that sheet that has the, the gradient bar on it and show them that they don't just have to move that child at that one spot. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, ma'am. I just uh, recently went to the car seat safety session at the national meeting and um, at that session they were saying that in pla different places around the country when you send parents to these spinning stations the, the person who's doing that car seat safety check is not necessarily a certified tech so are these places that you've listed here are the people going the ones, the, the the ones that are here in in, in this area, the Troop G, the Bossier EMS, and the Caddo Sheriff's Office Safety Town, they only are allowing certified technicians to do it. People take them to the fire station, and unfortunately, the fire department have gotten out of that business. I don't know why. Um, and that's another thing of advocacy. Y'all are paying those taxes for fire protection, but those guys are sitting around the fire People drive up for help and they may not be giving them the right message. There's no reason that they should not be certified um, because here in Louisiana it's free. Uh, we have a limited number of seats but we're over a hundred people, almost 200, are trained every year and it only takes 
about 12 hours to keep certified for a two-year cycle. Um, so there's really no reason for people not to keep their certification up. Um, Y'all know what it takes to be a doctor. I have no clue. But you have to have continuing education to maintain your license. It's the same thing with us. Um, and it's, it's, you know, 12 hours over two years is not that much time. Um, especially if you're a fireman. So you could do it on duty. But, get down. I know they need a three day course, but some of our patients don't have the means to always go to, you know, see these checks because they don't have cars or transportation. Is there a way you can give us a quick rundown? You know, just they come in and their, their belt clip is the belt clip uh, the, the harnesses for rear facing children should be at or below the shoulder and that's because of the dynamics of the movement you want that child to stay in that seated position forward facing it's at or above now there are different kinds of seats that's why I didn't want to get too deep in the in the weeds of looking at the seats but certain seats you have to have in the top slot if they're forward facing because it's the only reinforced slot there may be on that seat. So it's going to, the main thing that we've been teaching everyone that comes for a check, let's get the owner's manual of the seat and the owner's manual of the car and do our research. Uh, the people that do the research come in and they usually have almost nothing wrong with their seats, but people that take a lot of things from granted they have the ones, and they're the ones that are the most at risk. Yes, ma'am. What are the most common problems that you see with the seat? Like simple things that we can screen for and help us with it? Well, they'd have to, you really have to go out to the car. Uh, the, the, if, if they're bringing a baby in in, in a carrier type seat, you can look at, as she said, where the harness clip is, that clip. And most of the seats nowadays have a diagram on the clip. It'll either have a diagram or it'll have words written. This goes at armpit level. That's what keeps those harnesses from falling off the shoulder. The check for tightness of, on the child is it's tight along their hips in the five point harness. And then it's tight enough on the shoulders that it's laying flat on them not digging into the flesh because it may be below the shoulder you could literally crush you know a baby pulling that thing tight but it should be lay flat on their body and when you try to pinch the webbing you can't pinch it your fingers slide off so that's the tightness test once it's in the car the check is that it can't move more than an inch side to side or be pulled from the back of the seat more than an inch um, so in the car, the main thing is people aren't locking the seat belt. And so the seat's allowed to move. Well, just like I explained earlier, they're doing all that movement. It's like falling until the seat belt is locked up and all the slacks come out. Well, by the time they've gotten all the slack out, that child's already into the back seat. They're into the back of the front seat because they're already that much closer. And then a forward facing, not using the top tether. That makes a four to six inch difference on head excursion. So they all want to use those things. Um, you know, I'm trying to stay within an hour at 55 minutes now. And I knew that this, you know, and, and I'm glad that y'all have these questions. Um, and you can do that research on those links. Um, but the main thing, you know, get that, that word going you know, because you do have that, you've got the mother and the child, and if the child walking and talking, when mom goes, oh yeah, when, when you ask about, did y'all wear your seatbelt, and the little kid looks at him like, you know, what are you talking about? You know, you can get clues like that. So, um, And uh, we actually, remember that car seat check at Safety Town? I think somebody came with a child in a booster seat, but the booster seat wasn't buckled up. Or did you work that one? Um, the, the boosters was not they were, they were sitting yeah. in a seat. They were just sitting on a, a box, basically. Uh, and that happens. People sit the car seat in, or they just lie, lay the child in the car seat. And it's like a catapult. I mean, that's what's going to happen. Yes, ma'am. Can you address the possibility of the office? What's the issue of the expiration date when you're going on the purchase? 
Carson and the other about um, the Carson being involved in an accident, whether or not it can be used <laughs> after that. On the safercar.gov, there should be a, uh, some information in there about the car seats and the accidents. There's five, five, five things they say that can happen in a crash that you would not have to replace the car seat. And one is nobody has to go to the hospital. The car can drive away. No airbags were deployed and there was not a collision was not on the side that the seat was in um, and there's no obvious deformities the thing is you know you buy a $200 car seat and you're in a crash does the manufacturer say replace after every crash or not you know if it's a like I say a parking lot crash where you hit and you get out and there's no damage to anything that's not, that seat actually hadn't been used. A seat belt that you should be wearing has not been used because there was no force actually exerted on those things. Uh, so that's, you know, that's one of those things. Expiration dates, some have, uh, the general rule is six years. Some have gone seven because plastics are getting better. Um, look at the manufacturer. They have websites. So whoever has that seat, it should have a label when it was made. Some of them have embossed into the back when it expires. Um, so you don't want to use one expired because the reason they put expirations is because of the degradation of the plastic and the nylon and everything else. So that's just, I mean, we could go on for three days. But, you know, the thing is to make some referrals um, to a specialist on car seats. If you want to go through the class yourself and you have four days, we it's not restricted to nurses, it's not restricted to police and fire. It's really anybody that's coming to do it as a service to their community. Um, because it is, you know, if somebody's not hurt in a crash, we all save money. Um, and as y'all, if, if you don't want to lose a patient to a car crash even, uh, one thing, hopefully you had some kind of bond with that person. You cared about them. And the other thing is, you don't get money from dead people. Yeah. Your practice with that person is over. Uh, you know, you don't. The only person that gets money from dead people is nobody. You know, even the undertaker doesn't get anything because he has to depend on somebody else to pay him. So, you know, you're trying to extend the life of that child and keep them in your practice. So, you know, that's, that's part of the message. You know, they are more likely to be hurt or killed in a car crash than almost any other method. Um, and that's why, that's why I'm here giving you this word. Let me just say two things. First, uh, we're sorry. We're sorry. Here. Okay, so when we started the car key program, it was really Marlene who, um, who really developed this program, and actually I'm pretty sure she came up with the acronym, the car keys acronym, as she does for many other things that, that she's involved in. And then, Bill, you've been involved with this right from the beginning? Or you've been? Well, it started uh, in the late 90s. I didn't really get on board. It might have been the early 90s. But, uh, I didn't get on board until 2000. Mm -hmm. as far as doing it specifically. Uh, I, as far as enforcement goes, I've been doing it since, since the 80s. Um, but, as, you know, as far as just as specific as that, as a specialty, if you want to look at it that way, I've only been doing it since 2004. Okay, so that's a long time of service, and so you've certainly influenced and helped the lives of many kids. and of their families. So thank you for coming and thanks for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you.